Human beings are indeed a particularly peculiar bunch. No other species derives pleasure from fear quite like we do, and the horror movie genre is solid proof of this fact. And with that being said, we have decided to take a look back at the greatest horror movies ever made, year by year, starting from 1970 to... Insert current year here. Why start at 1970? Well, because that's just what was decided upon. Anyway, horror movies of the 70s reflected the grim mood of the decade. After the optimism of the 60s with its sexual and cultural revolutions and the moon landings, the 70s were something of a disappointment. By 1970, the party was over. The Beatles split, Janice and Jimmy died, and in many ways it was all downhill from there. Nixon, Nam, oil strikes, glam rock, medallions, and feather haircuts. However, when society goes bad, horror films get good, and the 70s marked a return to the big budget, respectable horror film, dealing with contemporary societal issues, addressing genuine psychological fears. We'll eventually make our way through the entire decade, but for now, this is the 10 best horror movies of 1970. Number 10. Bloodiest horror show in history. I drink your blood. Men become animals and eat their victims. I drink your blood. Thirsty zombies ravaging a peaceful countryside. <laughs> I drink your blood. Energetic, sloppy, and extremely watchable, especially if you're sitting down with a bong and or a beer. I drink your blood is true blue camp all the way. Plus is vicious, violent, and frequently fall down funny. Clearly created with a grindhouse style audience in mind. The film doesn't worry too much about the quality of what's on screen but the quantity of outrageous madness it could pull off before the end credits finally arrive. Frankly, you haven't lived until you've seen a gang of Satanist hippies massacre a house full of rats before chowing down on rabid dog meat and flying into a murderous rage. Number 9 Hatchet for the Honeymoon, aka Blood Brides, is about a series of slayings committed by a good looking but impotent man who owns a bridal shop. Alienated from his wife because of his failure to consummate the marriage, he offs women dressed in his bridal gowns. He disposes of the bodies in an incinerator. The police suspect him but have no evidence. After he eventually does away with his nagging but wealthy wife, in a twist, she becomes the ghost that won't leave. And in this version of the common ghost story trope, his undead wife is visible to everyone but our main character, whose side she never leaves. Let's see him try Cora and her picking up brides now. It's inescapable. I'm sure of it. <gasps> Number eight. I'm the mumsy. I'm only the nanny. My name's Sonny. My name's Girlie. Mumsy, Nanny, Sonny, and Girlie are a happy family. They live in a big old house to which they bring their friends, like Soldier, and number five, and especially new friend. They all have favorite hobbies. Sonny likes archery. <laughs> Girlie plays with her dolls. Nanny digs needlepoint, and especially redecorating. And Mumsy, dear Mumsy, just takes care of the guests. And you're not a little boy. 
Mumsy, Nanny, Sonny, and Girlie are a happy family. Together, they play lots of games. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. The family that plays together, slays together. Girlie, aka Mumsy, Nanny, Sonny, and Girlie, is a bloodless, fully dressed, sober good time. Quite the rarity in the genre. A group of adults play house like children, taking the roles of the mother, the nanny, the younger brother, and the kid sister. Sonny and Girlie, the 20 something children of the family, are sent out into the world by Mumsy and Nanny to find playmate friends to bring back home. This involves going out to public parks to find homeless and or drunk men and inviting them home for dinner and playtime. Once the men arrive at their home, they are forced to play along with the family's games and rules. They are treated as a new child in the house. Those that break the rules get cut in pieces. <laughs> We're a happy family. Come on. Eat up. The mumsy likes having people in. Don't you like being looked after? Naughty, mister. You're going to need to learn the rules. Number seven. <laughs> Count Yorga, Vampire, is a film that throws you into a world of which we know little. Strange. Frightening, whispered from generation to generation until it becomes a scream out of the past. What separated Count Yorga from Christopher Lee's Hammer Dracula films released around the same time, films we'll get to in a moment, were that all of the Hammer Dracula films up to 1970 had been period pieces, and Count Yorga was set in modern times. What makes this so remarkable is that, in its aftermath, a bona fide deluge of vampire flicks with contemporary settings were made, extending all the way up to the present day. Even the comparatively sober Hammer Dracula series had jumped on the bandwagon by 1972. It's enough to make you really wonder why the idea never really crossed anyone's mind before. Maybe the industry just needed a good movie to copy. Number six. Here, several notable moments are taken directly from Bram Stoker's original novel, such as the sight of Dracula scaling his castle walls as well as his dominion over animals, preferably bats. The opening of the film shows just how distasteful it's going to be when a huge bat revives Dracula by puking up blood on his ashes. Another scene shortly thereafter showcases a group of outsized vampire bats massacring a group of women hiding within a church, whilst the men folk lay waste to Dracula's castle. This entry has its detractors, but it's nonetheless a favorite among Hammer Horror fans. Number 5 Feel the cold grip of his presence. Sense the clammy excitement of his evil. Taste the sharp fear that he alone can bring. Dracula's blood. Taste the Blood of Dracula is another dark and well-made entry in the Hammer's Dracula series. Much more violent than his predecessors, the more gory spillage and skin definitely stands as a foreshadowing of things to come with Hammer. As this is the time period where the studio sought to catch up with other films of the era with increasingly explicit content. In this regard, it nails it. Number four. 
In his debut feature, Dario Argento explores traits, themes, and concepts now commonly associated with his blood-soaked body filmography. Fetishized depictions of violence and death, identity, gender, Freudian analysis, paranoia, voyeurism, and spectatorship. This is all played out in the Stranger Abroad story of an American writer who witnesses an attempted murder in an art gallery in Rome. When he begins his own investigation, he unwittingly draws the killer's attention and must recall a vital clue distorted by memory before his own life is taken. Check it out. Number 3 Come with us if you dare, into a twilight world of unspeakable horror. You must die! Everybody must die! Sample, if you dare, the deadly passion of the vampire lovers. The Vampire Lovers became the first of a very loose trilogy surrounding the immortal and evil Kalnstein clan and her young and voluptuous daughter. She uses her feminine and unworldly trickery to get what she truly wants. Young women that she preys upon slowly, having them fall deeper and deeper under her spell. She also has no compunctions about wooing dopey men in order to get them out of the way of her prizes. With this premise in place, the film naturally has some very steaming situations. While it is never graphic nor exploitive in this department, it is certainly very tantalizing. Give it a watch. Number two. Yes, folks, this isn't any cheap X-rated movie or any fifth-rate porno play. This is the show you want. Lady Divine's Cavalcade of Perversions. The sleaziest show on earth. Not actors, not paid imposters, but real, actual filth. Who have been carefully screened in order to present to you the most flagrant violation of natural law known to man. <laughs> Fish. You're sick and repulsive! Oh, you, my dear, are dead! When most people think of John Waters and his exercises in bad taste, the immediate reaction is to turn to Pink Flamingos as his shock masterpiece. Look a little harder, though, and you'll find multiple maniacs. While Pink Flamingos is a little dated in its shock value, aside from that infamous ending, multiple maniacs never fails to get a reaction. Watching this flick in the age of ultra-cautiousness is both thrilling and disturbing. If the sacrilegious extremes don't make you squirm, the deeply uncomfortable note of watching a drag superstar salivate over executing cops just might. But if you take the film's lunacy seriously enough to be outraged, then you're at the wrong movie. Number 1 Of work of both visceral directness and lingering allure, Valerie and Our Week of Wonders is a uniquely influential film. One of intoxicating sensation and unconscious immersion, and one, for that matter, often recognized and referenced more than actually seen. Based on a novel by the poet Betslav Navel, the film paints his portrait of a young girl's sexual awaken in highly allegorical strokes through a mix of gothic imagery, folklore cues, and mythic conceits. If you are too anxious about decoding what it all means, you're likely to be quite entranced. Thanks for watching, and let us know what your favorite horror film of the year is in the comment section below.